Hey everyone, it's Franchise Horror Reviews, and today I'm bringing you my part three of ranking the entire Halloween franchise from worst to best. In this video, I'm going to be discussing my top five in the franchise, basically my number five to my number one film. If you missed part one and part two, which covers the bottom three movies and the middle five movies, I'm going to put the links down in the description down below, and I encourage you to go watch those before you watch this, so that way you're caught up. But if not, feel free to watch this and maybe go back and see my thoughts on the other movies that didn't make it in my top five. Now, I want to give you a huge disclaimer. My top five is going to be one of the biggest hot takes you will ever see on YouTube. <laughs> my top five is a very weird mix. Like I said in my part one, to me, the franchise hit its golden point from the first four movies. That's including... You know, Halloween 1 and Halloween 2 from 1978 and 1981, Season of the Witch, and Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, all of which are in my top five. However, um, that being said, it's not going to be in the order that you normally see it. <laughs> um, to give you a little backstory, I grew up with this franchise. I started watching this uh, movie, this movie series when I was about maybe six or seven years old. And I was a massive fan of Halloween as a child. Halloween, the time of year, the holiday, um, was basically birthed from my love of watching, you know, childhood kids' horror products like The Haunted Mask and The Haunted Mask 2 episodes from Goosebumps. And that kind of translated into other things. Um, I started reading, you know, some Goosebumps books, and then I started watching more horror films. And I mainly like to focus on the Halloween-centered stuff, because that's what I was used to. And when I discovered the Halloween franchise, I was, like I said, around six or seven years old. And I mainly started on the first film from 1978. I started on Halloween 2 from 1981, Season of the Witch, you know, and 4 through 6, which is Curse of Michael Myers. It ends there. Those were like the six movies I grew up with. Then... I kind of watch H2O or Resurrection from time to time because those two would play a lot on like FX and other channels. But I watched the Halloween tapes quite a lot. And I'll tell you this, uh, I have my personal favorite. And I've kind of already shared it in some of my favorite horror movies of all time video uh, that I made. And you might already know what my favorite's going to be. And it might upset a few. And I, like I said, I just want to get this off my chest. These five, I don't think, are ever going to be changed unless they reboot the franchise. And one of these movies might perplex a lot of you, <laughs> especially fan, uh, fans of certain movies uh, and people who dislike one of the movies that aren't from the first four films in the franchise that made it into my top five. You're probably going to be upset, <laughs> especially where I place it. Uh, but without further ado, I, I guess let's start off because um, I have a lot to unpack in this video. So my number five, I guess, in the Halloween franchise of all time goes to a movie that I think is just flat out good. It's just a solid movie for what it is, and I've always thought that. And it is Halloween 2 from 1981. I know a lot of you want to grab your pitchforks right now and stab me right through the chest, um, but... Halloween 2, I think, is mildly overrated. With that being said, though, I think Halloween 2 still has a lot going for it. Uh, it has that ambiance and flair to that original 1978 classic film that we all love. You know, the film on this t-shirt. The film that started this franchise. And you can't be upset with it too much. You know, it... it <clears throat> For it, for what the film is, it's essentially a part two to the first movie. And I know that there's consternation behind John Carpenter's effort put in the movie. How he and Deborah Hill didn't really want to make this, but the money, you know, money talks in Hollywood. And they were struggling to get this movie, you know, at least on the script and finding the, you know, the right director. They settled with Rick Rosenthal. Uh, who was, I think, like their third choice. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I think they still managed to make a classic movie here. And I know a lot of you out there put this movie as number two, but 
I think it has its flaws. Um, starting with unpopular opinions, I don't view Dick Warlock's performance as a flaw. I'm going to be honest. I like Dick Warlock's slide walk and his slowness. It, it, it feels like to me that a lot of people want to bash Dick Warlock because he doesn't match with uh, Castle's Michael Myers from the first film. But I kind of like the way he looks. Now, there are a lot of give and takes with Dick Warlock helming Michael Myers. You know, the mask was left under Deborah Hill's bed in a smoke-filled house. So the mask in you know 1981 is the same mask from the first movie, but it looks dingy. And the way it fits Dick Warlock's head is the most awkward-looking fit of a mask in the entire franchise, if you ask me. And you see his eyes bulge out... And it's a, it's a thing that I just don't like to see in Halloween movies. To me, the shape, Michael Myers. What makes Michael Myers the shape is that he has blacked out eyes. You cannot see his eyes. To me, what separates uh, a Halloween movie with the shape and a Halloween movie with Michael Myers is Michael Myers shows his eyes. The shape has, you can't see his eyes. Um, and... Yeah, you could even correlate that onto specific scenes in movies where you can kind of see his eyes. Um, that's just my belief. Halloween 2 feels more like a movie about Michael Myers than about The Shape. Um, yeah, there are some really baffling choices in this movie, though, that I think really... I want to say bruised the legs of the franchise moving forward, but it definitely married this idea that uh, Lori and Michael were brother and sister... Um, you know, also, Lori is infamously absent for most of this movie after only falling down a flight of stairs and getting sliced on her arm. She goes to the hospital, um, which isn't that... I mean, it's understandable, uh, but she really didn't suffer any big, you know, things other than just trauma and, you know, a slice and dice on her arm. But she goes to the hospital and they put her under and give her anesthesia. And, and you have we deal with... Two different subplots. You have the Loomis subplot who tries to hunt down Michael who escaped and Michael goes off to the neighbor's house and kills the neighbors and that has a lot of consternation with that because the neighbors clearly heard the gunshots but didn't lock their doors. <laughs> like, you know, there's a lot of forced things in this movie but I iconic moments because of these forced things. And the whole Loomis subplot is just really odd. You know, you have Marion Chambers and, you know, Sheriff Brackett, and they try to go on this witch hunt looking for Michael, and they accidentally kill this teenager wearing a similar costume, and there's a, a really ridiculous car explosion of a <laughs> of this scene where, you know, the iconic scene where the teenager's walking in the street, and the van coming down the street's going at least 70 miles an hour and just barrels into him, and ex the car explodes, and they... They think they caught Michael Myers, and when they go to the, uh, I guess, the examining room at the police station, they look and they they, they think that it's not Michael Myers. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> uh, a lot of the things dealing with the Loomis plotline, um, down to, you know, when they go to the school, uh, when they're following the breadcrumbs, and they find the classroom with the word Salmhain, or I think that's how you pronounce it, Salmon, uh, written on the chalkboard and Donald Pleasant's infam infamously pronounced it Sam Hain and they kept it in the movie. This introduces this concept that uh, there's like this spiritual aspect to his character potentially. Sam Hain is like the, uh, the, the old Celtic word for Halloween um, which I think is this is the scene that the Cult of Thorn you know four five and six tried to at first maybe hint at in the fourth movie in the fifth and sixth movie, <clears throat> I guess try to expound on it, but did it poorly. Uh, and th that word never gets brought up until six. So it's a lot of bizarre stuff. Um, I've already brought up the whole Mo Lori and Michael being connected as brother and sister. Marion Chambers tells Dr. Loomis. Um, and she's she's like a keeper of the secret. Uh, which is, uh, I guess, an interesting angle. And I think... I think that if you're going to keep bringing back Michael in all these movies, I think there has to be that sibling element to make that work anyways. So it's a blessing and a curse because for the original timeline, 
it, it works as a finale movie because John Carpenter wanted to kill Michael in the explosion at the end. Um, but Money Talks and Stafa Akai wanted to make more money. So we got Halloween 4, which is one of my personal favorite Halloween movies. I have it higher than Halloween 2 for a reason. But, you know, Halloween 2 has some good aspects to it. You have some really upped violence and gore. And even the mo movies that came after, like Scream 1996, based a lot of, um, you, you know, a lot what it has on Halloween 1 and Halloween 2. And even Scream 2 talks about the rules of a sequel, which a lot of the rules are stemmed back to this specific film as well, uh, where they up the gore, up the violence, up the kills. Um, and it shows in this movie. There are some pretty graphic kills for its time. Uh, it was trying to compete with competitors like Friday the 13th, who, which were showing visual, uh, stunning visual deaths done by the you know makeup effects of Tom Savini in that first film. And John Carpenter realized after he shot the movie that it needs more, it needs more brutality. So he went back and filmed extra to make it comp competitive. And I think what he added was pretty good. But there's a really big tonal clash between 1978 and Halloween 2. 1978 there. Are, there is a mix, that perfect mixture of off-screen and on-screen kills, and it seems like Halloween 2 has that mixture, but it definitely tries to ham it up in the Michael Myers being this killer artist motif thing. And while some of it works, um, the problem is he's killing a bunch of characters you don't care about. The characters are, you know, hospital workers, and you get a sense, you know, the the hospital workers that work for the, like, dri driving the ambulance take Lori and the ambulance back to the hospital, and, of course, that's their connection to Lori. And you see, like, this uh, this nurse get killed off screen, and her pool of blood's laying down, and the guy slips and hits his head. But there are, all, there are also some really good kills, like the iconic nurse getting stabbed in her back in the hallway, or the security guard getting his neck slit, or the needle getting jabbed in the head of that woman. And... Probably the most popular death of the movie is the hot tub death where the guy gets killed and then Michael comes in with the naked nurse and he, after he turns up the heat of the water and essentially boils her skin off of her face and throws her aside. Um, some really brutal kills in the movie, but I have to say, I think the biggest sin this movie has is that it's just a really slow burn of a movie. It's not that it's boring, it's just really slow burnish. And there's two different subplots. You got the hospital subplot and the Loomis subplot that take forever to converge. Uh, and the Loomis stuff is just straight up stupid. <laughs> but the Lori stuff is okay, but the problem is also Lori is absent. She's in a hospital bed. And a lot of it's just Michael trying to break into the hospital. The hospital setting works, though. Um, there's some really good kills, but personally, it just takes too long to get... To Loomis and Lori at Haddonfield Memorial Hospital and by then the movie really just kind of wraps up really quick uh, compared to the rest of it. There are some really thrilling uh, chase scenes where Lori's trying to run away from Michael and like the basement of the hospital which are really iconic scenes and I love it for that. Uh, the parking lot where the guy gets the guy that bumped his head on the floor passes out from a concussion. Um, and then, of course, the ending with the explosion and, you know, Laurie shooting Michael Myers in the eyeballs with guns that H2O supposedly was, that Retcon 4, 5, and 6 is supposed to follow up this movie and you don't see it. Any bullet holes, any scarring in Chris Duran's eyeballs that bulge out of the mask in that movie. <laughs> so, um, yeah, th this feels more like a Michael Myers movie than a shape movie to me. Um, but has its iconic moments. The ending is really whatever to me. I actually prefer the TV cuts ending for a lot of reasons uh, compared to this and kind of what they did with that character that Lori befriended in the hospital. Um, in the TV cut, she like leaves off with him and she tells him that they survived and they beat Michael Myers essentially. And in my head canon, that's a better setup to Halloween 4 because that gives a lot of backstory to maybe the origins of Jamie Lloyd's father could be this guy here. Um, if you ask me, you know, I'm not going to touch on the TV cut too much 
but I actually prefer kind of like the best elements that the TV cut added for, for this movie with the best elements of the theatrical cut. And I believe there is a fan cut out there of this film, and I watch that a lot because um, it, it does splice it. But yeah, this movie's this movie's a good movie. Um, yeah, like I said, has its negatives, but it's deserving in the top five. Now my number four, brace yourselves, people, brace yourselves, <laughs> brace yourselves. I know a lot of you hate this movie. I know a lot of you are really upset with the Blumhouse trilogy, but this movie is my guilty pleasure of the franchise. Uh, and my number four is Halloween Kills. Yes, Halloween Kills is my number four favorite Halloween movie. Now, there's a lot I cannot excuse about this movie. You know, that has some piss poor dialogue. The whole evil dies tonight shit is awful. It's bad. As a follow up to 2018, for really 2018 not really trying in the story department, Kills didn't have much to go off of. Uh, Kills was given that. You know, it needs to be the Empire Strikes Back of the trilogy. Um, which I, I think that's a bogus excuse because how many times in history have we got an Empire Strikes Back worthy direct sequel in a trilogy? Hardly ever. <laughs> Hardly ever. Okay? Um, but I digress. But if I'm going to go back on the tangent of Halloween Kills here, you know... Bringing back some legacy characters was awesome. I love that they brought in Anthony Michael Hall to play Tommy Doyle. I love bringing back Marion Chambers. I love, I love, love, love uh, Lindsay Wallace coming back. Um, you know, and even some new characters they, characters they added. Uh, tying Officer, Officer Hawkins to the events of 1978. Um, ha having his um, younger self played by a guy, I think his name is Thomas Mann. <clears throat> I like that element of the story. I like that it feels like a, a legacy character love letter, and it feels like a flashback, but the problem is is that, in my opinion, they should have just made this whole movie a flashback. Because it, they didn't have enough story from 2018 to make this movie, and I feel like a flashback movie would have been a cool change of pace in the franchise and possibly could have made this the a standalone-feeling movie in the trilogy, and really could have helped sell this for a lot of fans. But I digress. Again, I, I just think there's some really missed, big, huge missed opportunities here. And they spent a lot of focus on this subplot shit that did, did not fucking work. The whole mob mentality, chasing down Oswald Cobblepot, escape Smith's Grove guy, is fucking stupid. And it's also really bad taste when you watch the guy kill himself at the hospital. It's just bad. <laughs> but, you know, I think this is my favorite film of the Blumhouse trilogy. And I think for all the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. To me, to me, I'm going to say this now. The ending could be infuriating if you like the character of Karen. Or if you like, if you like um, Michael Myers not being like ever beaten up or something. Uh, but... To me, I I like the way this film does Michael Myers throughout the entirety of it. When I think of a legacy sequel to a Halloween movie, if you're going to do a Halloween movie 40 years later after the original, I don't want the same song and dance as the original. I You know, this is a modern audience. Michael needs to be on his A-game. And if you ask me, this is my favorite Michael of all time in any of the movies. Shocker. Shocker. I just said some blasphemous shit to a lot of you, right? But hear me out. I think James Jude Courtney really hit a stride with this performance of Michael in this movie. A lot of a lot of franchise high points with Michael in terms of kills in this movie for me. From the firehouse massacre to the complete siege throughout the neighborhood where he kills the guy in front of his wife. And, you know, she's that woman that gets, you know, her vocal cords messed up. She can't talk no more and Halloween ends. she He's, like, picking up numerous knives and stabbing the guy in the back. It's just stuff that you can't unsee. And I, I love this version of Michael. This interpretation of Michael, honestly, is my favorite. 
And this is what makes the movie a guilty pleasure. Like, this is a guilty pleasure love for me. This is one of the four films I actually love. But, you know, a lot of people in their top fives, they'll have that one movie that they love for a specific thing. And they will say, oh, it's not great for other reasons. To be honest, most Halloween movies in this franchise, besides, I think, two, are considered perfect to me. This film is far from perfect. But to me, it has a lot of the best elements dealing with Michael. Um... And like I said, I like the flashback elements. I like the Easter eggs they put in this movie. The kills are awesome. Um, there's really no plot to it. But like I said, it's, it's like a carnage candy experience with Michael Myers. Uh, you know, the kill count in this movie is outrageous and high. And it's just fun. It's just a fun movie. If you can look past the bad dialogue, which is absolutely atrocious, there are some nuggets of good in here. Like I said, the flashback of Dr... Uh, of Officer Hawkins is is really good. I like the way that looks. It makes sense to tie this to the timeline that, you know, this timeline is supposed to be the, the timeline to erase all that came before it besides this 1978 film. And this one kind of gives reason to why this exists. Even though it's not answered whatsoever in Halloween Ends, I appreciate trying to set that up. I like the dynamic of Laurie Strode and and Officer Hawkins in the hospital and they're talking about the evil of Michael. And, you know, he regrets not killing him. That, that's emotional stuff. Like, of course you would regret it. And, like, you know, in hindsight, in the next movie, Laurie regrets, you know, potentially, you know, trying to try to kill Michael on her own without the help that she probably needed. And that's why the town hates her. You know, a lot of this stuff is, is coherent in hindsight. But... I'm not trying to, you know, boast up this trilogy of movies because they're, they're not that great. But there are some stuff that carry over to the next film that hold up. And like I said, if you watch the end of 2018 and the opening of this film, this has my favorite opening of any Halloween movie. <laughs> because, you know, it involves catching up to the events that this movie takes place on. You know, you find out Officer Hawkins is alive. He gets rescued by Allison's boyfriend. And that character... And Allison could have some ups and downs in the movie. And there's a gnarly ending uh, where he has one of the most brutal kills in the entire franchise. Uh, and there's also some really fun, funny jokes in here, I think, that really land, um, if you ask me. A lot of people have problems with Big John and Little John, but that's one of my favorite parts of this entire movie. It's just, you know, this is gay couple that moved into the Myers home. Um... And they, you know, mess with some trick-or-treaters trying to prank them. And I love their banter and their jokes. And, you know, Michael still has that artistic flair. Because the Blumhouse trilogy wants to highlight it. And you do see it within those scenes. And I, I don't see the problem with a lot of this stuff. Some people are really up in arms about it. I, I love a lot about it. I think that... You know, that playground scene where you see the kids in the uh, Season of the Witch masks? That's really intense when Lindsay's by herself trying to hide from Michael. I was legit tense in the theater. Which, mind you, if you didn't know, I live in the town that Halloween Kills was filmed in. And a lot of the scenes, like Haddonville Memorial Hospital was my community college. Um, a lot of the town that you see in the movie was, is the town I live in. So, I was really happy and like nerding out over that and then it honestly was one of my all-time favorite theater experiences because since it was filmed in our town there was a huge event at my local theater and I had a blast in the theater watching this and it's one of those movies this is the movie I've watched the most out of the movies that came out in the past 15 years I've seen kills more than Rob Zombie's Halloween 1 uh, and 2 I've seen this movie more than 2018. I've seen this movie more than ends, of course. But I just love this movie. It's a guilty pleasure, guys. It's a guilty pleasure. And if you ask me, I really like the cliffhanger ending when he's looking out, the, you know, seeing his reflection in the window. That's a really intriguing idea to leave off on. I don't think ends really answer that question, but honestly, it might sound crazy, but I've been, I've kind of embraced this movie and, and I headcanoned it as like a, a standalone to me. I can watch this by itself and be just fine. I don't see why a lot of people were up in arms about it, but I love this movie. And it comes from a place of love. 
It's not the greatest, but one of the four Halloween movies I truly do love. So, yeah. Now, <laughs> my number three. My number three, I was struggling putting this movie here because if you ask me, this is honestly my favorite Michael Myers film. But is it the best? Can I really put this above these other two movies above it? No. Um, but without further ado, uh, my number three is Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers. Yeah, this movie is my favorite Michael Myers movie, aside from the original 1978 movie. It has its clear flaws. It has its clear flaws. Let's get them out the way. George, Wilbur, you know, is a good intention guy, is a really nice guy. But what they did and how he made him look, the, the fucking producers decided to make him look like goddamn Frankenstein and give him a mask that looks like, oh my god, the, the mask looks like, you know, Mr. Wilson from, from Dennis the Menace with his mustache shaved and he has Michael Myers hair. It looks terrible. The, the mask looks terrible and the hockey pads on George Wilbur is unnecessary. He's already a bigger guy and I believe that they filmed, they had one guy do a lot of the scenes in the movie and then they decided to fire that guy and replace him with George Wilbur and they filled him out with hockey pads to make him more, I guess, bulky but you don't really need to do that. And it's just disappointing because this, despite the crappy looking My, Michael Myers and some con, a little bit of contrived elements in this movie, this easily is the most satisfying Halloween movie ever, in my opinion. Yeah, there are some loose things with Jamie's dream vision in the beginning of the movie when we meet Jamie Lloyd, played by Danielle Harris. And I think she's the most standout character in this entire franchise, if you ask me. And you get the backstory about how she recently had lost her mother and father in a car accident and she's living at the Carruthers house and she has an older foster sister named Rachel played by Ellie Cornell and you see this relationship this like reluctant sibling ship that really doesn't feel natural but the two of them are trying to salvage the relationship as the movie goes on and they become more connected because of Jamie's experience with Michael Myers so the movie you know, brings back Michael Myers, kind of like, it's kind of like a splice between its own idea and the first Halloween film, where he's bandaged up at Smith's Grove, and there's a prison transfer on the night before Halloween, for some fucking reason, like I said, there are some contrived points, and it's a stormy night, they put Michael in an ambulance, he's been in a coma for many years, after the explosion of Halloween 2, and on the, in the ambulance ride, uh, the guy, the guy in the ambulance makes mention that he has a niece, and he, you see him clench his fist, <laughs> but it's, it's kind of hokey and fun at the same time, he, he, you know, punches his thumb through the guy's forehead and kills both of them, and the ambulance drives off the road, and once this happens, Dr. Loomis hears of this and freaks out, and essentially we get Donald Pleasance, I think, this is probably my favorite performance of Donald Pleasance in these movies next to the original. Donald Pleasance really hams it up in this. Uh, he has burn marks from Halloween 2. He survived the explosion with Michael as well, which I think was a good move. And he's tracing the tracks of Michael. And Michael's, in, you know, in his... I, I think this is iconic. Michael's bandaged up face. He's in a, you know, a hospital gown. And he goes to the mechanic shop. And he kills the mechanic off screen, steals his jumpsuit. And Dwight Little's iconic pan-in shot of Michael wearing the, the mechanic's outfit with the bandaged face. It's just so good. It's so good. And Dwight Little's cinema, uh, directing chops in this, in my opinion, is the closest to the magic John Carpenter was able to do in the original movie. Those shots in the beginning when Jamie's having that vision of Michael. And like it's kind of like a lucid nightmare where she's going in and out of seeing Michael in her dreams. We don't know why. But these little effects where Michael, you know, there's lightning and Michael's face appears out of the darkness. Or he's at the end of the mirror, Jamie's walking across and you see the lightning trickle across the mirror. And then on the very last shot, boom, Michael appears. It's so good. The, the way this movie looks, you know, it's not 
the same type of cameras that were used in the first two films, or even the third film for that matter. But it looks great. It looks great. Genuinely great. And we haven't even talked about the, the characters in this movie. Like I said, Jamie Lloyd's great. Rachel Carruthers is, is great. Both of these characters are my two favorite characters in the entire franchise. And what Halloween 5, why I hate that movie so much, is because they pissed all over these characters. But I love the two of them. They're fantastic. Some of the supporting characters, like Ellie Cornell's boyfriend, who's cheating on her with the sh uh, with Sheriff Meeker's daughter, um, even they're, they're, they're like iconic in this franchise in their own right. And Sheriff Meeker is even a bigger fucking badass than any of the Sheriff characters we will ever see in the Halloween franchise before or since. Sheriff Meeker gets wasted off in Halloween 5, unfortunately, but man in this movie, he is fucking badass. And Dr. Loomis... He's kind of grown on that unhinged thing after he went through that explosion on Halloween 2. But I really like Dr. Loomis in this movie. I really like a lot of the kills. Like, there's so many iconic franchise moments in this movie. You know, when the, um, Sheriff Meeker's daughter gets pierced by a shotgun. You know, in almost every Halloween movie, you see that Michael pins somebody to a wall. And it's usually with a knife. But he uses a goddamn shotgun to pierce her through the wall. Like, how fucking badass. He squeezes a guy's head in. He um, rips a guy's throat out. Um, he massacres an entire police force off, off screen. But even that's badass. Because so, it shows decapitated heads up in there. And... <clears throat> You know, it does have some really stupid shit, like the infamous school scene where you see a pan and shot of blonde and pink-faced Michael Myers throwing Dr. Loomis out of a window. And the whole um, angry mob, like um, native uh, Haddonfield residents uh, hear that Michael Myers is back, so they, you know, try to team up with Sheriff Meeker, who's making like a, I guess, a, a rogue force of mercenaries of the town. And they go on this witch hunt for Michael and they accidentally kill a guy in the bush. Like, there's, there are some dumb shit. And like I said, the look of Michael really hams it up in some of these scenes and makes it look awkward. Like in the whole, when he's in the back of the pickup truck scene. He looks like fucking Frankenstein with these damn hockey pads throwing people off the car and shit. But, yeah, it's just little things about this movie that weigh it down. It's not really the big things. Yeah, the concept is loose. A lot of people like to, to point at this. What the hell is up with this connection in these dreams with Jamie and Michael? There's visions throughout the movie that create great visuals. And like Jamie picks out this clown costume that's supposed to connect to Michael Myers in the first film. But it's never really expounded on. And a lot of that is predicated on the finale of this movie. Which is great if you ask me. There's like a full on firing squad that launches Michael into a mine shaft. And there's an explosion. But there's a twist to it. Where Jamie may or may not be you know, touted as a killer, and she's lost the ability to talk, and Dr. Loomis is screaming no over and over again. That, to me, I think is the most iconic twist in this franchise, love it or hate it. I love it. Uh, I don't really get that there's this possession angle that Michael's possessing her or anything, but I think that it's just supposed to be like a transference of evil type of metaphor, and how they didn't just do that to the next movie is beyond me. I still don't know if they went into five with her being a child killer. Would it have held up? I couldn't tell you because it didn't happen, but I'm willing to try that. And we kind of did get it with Rob Zombie's 2007 film. So I can tell you from that experience, I'm kind of glad we didn't, but kind of curious to see if it did exist. <laughs> But yeah, I love this movie. To me, this is probably the most satisfying story out of all of them. You know, you get like a clear finale. You get this relationship. You get characterization of Jamie Lloyd and Rachel Carruthers. You expand on their characters. There's some really fun suspense. There's a really dark and cold fall atmosphere. It feels like Halloween. It feels cold. It's not the best in the franchise. Um, but it starts essentially from the opening of the movie, which in my opinion has one of the best opening you know, credit sequences in the history of film. It's so atmospheric, and it's so simple, it just sets up the the mood from the get-go. I think that this movie's a genuine classic, and this is like one of the, 
The Four I Love. I think this is my favorite Michael Myers sequel forever. I don't th see that ever changing. If they ever wanted to go back and do another timeline, they need to go back and just start from four. <laughs> or race five and six and try this again, if you ask me. I love, 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 love this movie. I love Ellie Cornell and I love Daniel Harris. If they reboot the franchise, bring them back. All right, now, my number two is going to piss almost every, every one of you off. <laughs> uh, but I, I love this movie. I love this movie. It comes from a place of respect more than just genuine love, but I think this movie is great. I think this is one of the two movies in the franchise I find to be perfect. And my number two is the original 1978 classic, Halloween. I don't know what to add to the conversation with this mo with this movie. This segment might be the shortest in this video, me talking about this movie, but this movie was birthed from the mind of two brilliant minds, Deborah Hill and John Carpenter. John Carpenter maybe had directed one or two films before this movie, and it's infamously known that he was hired by this guy who took a chance on him and wanted him to make a movie. And the simple print idea was babysitter uh, being attacked by a killer. And they took this idea and they made a pop culture phenomenon. And uh, for a lot of people, one of the greatest movies ever made. And what makes this movie great is the simplicity to it. From the music, which is one of the more simple scores you'll hear in, 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 in movies... You, you can't you can't mistake it. When you hear that song, it immediately takes you to this film. Every single time. No matter what iteration, no matter how many sequels, how many timelines, how many botched alternate universes this franchise will do, I don't think none of those movies will ever take away the legacy of this film for a lot of people. Halloween from 1978 is truly a cinematic masterpiece in a lot of, a lot of regards. It revolutionized horror. In 1978, there was a long stretch of time, you know, probably since Night of the Living Dead, I would say, and maybe Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, 68, 74, 78. You know, there's a period of, you know, drive the, the drive-in era of movies were kind of dying out. You know, people were stopping seeing the novelty in movies anymore. And this little indie movie comes out with a small budget with you know Jamie Lee Curtis playing the main character and she was not well known but the only she did have some you know ties to the le legendary Janet Lee and uh Tony Curtis Janet Lee from Psycho and Tony Curtis if you don't know who Tony Curtis is I don't know <laughs> if I can be friends with you <laughs> so you know Jamie Lee Curtis this little little young woman Starring in her first major role, playing the main character, Laurie Strode. And while it hasn't aged perfectly with her acting in this movie, which is one of the two negatives I have with it, it's not really a negative I would deduct anything on. It's just one of those movies that it feels timeless. And you feel that innocence and that connection to Jamie Lee Curtis in this movie, and you understand why this connection is there. And... We get introduced to The Shape. This is the movie that truly introduces The Shape. Not Michael Myers, but this movie introduces The Shape. Yeah, in the opening scene, where you see, you know, the mask over, over the camera, and there's a butcher knife, and he's stabbing the girl, and it's revealed to be a little kid. How shocking that was the first time you saw this movie. And it's still shocking today. It's one of the more iconic opening sequences ever in any movie ever. And you get this sense that there's this looming dread about to happen in this movie involving this character. And we meet the shape. The pure essence of evil. We meet Dr. Sam Loomis, played by Donald Pleasance, who's his in charge of this Michael Myers character. And as the movie goes on, and Michael Myers escapes, and he dons his infamous white mask. One of the most iconic symbols in horror history, in horror movie history. This movie really turned the tide from what the yesteryears of, 
you know, hokey science fiction and universal monsters, Michael Myers was the first iteration of the modern monster. Rooted in realism, rooted in this mysticism and this essence of evil that essentially could live in all in a lot of us and he, possibly even all of us and he doesn't talk he just moves like he's hunting prey and the simplicity of it the the atmosphere of it it being halloween him being gravitated to wearing masks on halloween makes it eerie accompanied with carpenter's music and how how it shot dean cundy's cinematography the lighting, the mood, it just all blends together. You know, iconic moment after iconic moment after iconic moment. Yeah, the movie isn't the goriest movie ever, but it has its it has its moments of true of true excellence. Where, you know, the iconic he's in the car and you see the fog in the in the in the windows and you know that he's in there and the girl doesn't know and he strangles her. Uh, the bed sheet scene where he puts on the bed sheet after pinning the guy on the wall with the butcher knife and he kills the girlfriend and he picks up the phone and he's breathing and Lori gets freaked out. You know, just iconic stuff. Doc, you know, Donald Pleasance really delivered a solid performance with Sam Loomis and this really created this blank slate that so many movies moving forward would try to imitate and we saw numerous copycats and a lot of people will tell you technically this is not the first slasher movie ever and i will agree it's not the first slasher movie but this is the movie that influenced all the most popular slashers minus texas texas chainsaw massacre without john carpenter's halloween there would be no friday the 13th a nightmare on elm street the list goes on this movie's so influential and powerful um it has its own merit. It has it, you know, it's timeless. That that final moment of the movie, the final 25, 30 minutes, is so intense. The way it's shot, the you, the tension is so wound tight you can cut it with a knife. Literally. Pun intended. <laughs> it's just iconic. And I love it. I love it for it being simple. I love it for it being timeless. I love everything about it. And I, you know, like I said, the acting's kind of spotty, the budget kind of shows, and some things may have not aged the best, but th that doesn't take away from it, right? This movie, we've all seen this movie. If you clicked on this video, you know this movie. Um, this is the movie that got me into Michael Myers. Um, do I love this one more than my number one? Some days I might, some days I might not. But... In this point in my life, I just like my number one more. And I'm not trying to piss people off. <laughs> because it's the only movie without Michael Myers in it. But that's just how I feel. And if I haven't given away yet. If I have not given it away yet. My number one in this franchise is Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. I know I feel the dislikes coming. I, f I feel your anger. I feel your anger. I feel your anger. But my love for this movie started from age six or seven and i had this movie on vhs as a kid and i just i think this movie is just more up my alley you know i like me a good slasher movie and, I, and for people calling this a slasher franchise is a fair statement but if you ask me i'm just not like gung-ho about slasher movies that like that you know, I, I do like me some gory movies, but Halloween 3 Season of the Witch is more my speed. I like weird movies. I like batshit crazy movies. I like, you know, reluctant hero, anti-hero type of characters leading the films. I like brutal villains with, you know, great acting and sinister plots. And, like, I like science fiction elements, body horror, creativity... And that's what this movie is. Tommy Lee Wallace, John Carpenter, Deborah Hill really took a big swing with this movie and in, in this franchise. And for the better or worse, this was the second timeline attempt they tried to do. Like the first two movies was t their original timeline. This is where that was supposed to end. But 
John Carpenter, you know, the almighty dollar, they want another Halloween movie, but Carpenter's like, I'm not doing Michael Myers again. They're like, all right, fine, well, let's make a new different Halloween movie. And the original idea was to make a different movie centered around the Halloween holiday every single year. And I would love to live in that alternate timeline sometime, sometimes. But I think Season of the Witch is, you know, I think a lot more people are warmed up to it these days. You know, when I was younger, I, I felt like I was the only Season of the Witch diehard fan. I think I was. <laughs> or one of the very, very select few of people who have loved this movie for at least 20 plus years. I think in more recent times, it's seen a definite reawakening. And people are starting to give it more credit that it definitely deserves. Now, there are some people that just don't like its weirdness or think it's a fine movie. I'm not trying to single anybody out, but, you know, that's still respectable. It does not deserve to be the worst because it does not have Michael Myers in it. And if you put it as your worst because it doesn't have Michael's, Michael Myers in it, but you still find it to be a great movie, I guess that's fine too. Um, if you're in... A Halloween fan because of Michael Myers and you don't like this movie because of it I don't shame you for it but don't shame me for it being my favorite because it doesn't have Michael Myers in it you get what I'm saying this movie is so weird I love Tom Atkins he's one of my favorite actors Stacey Nelkin she's beautiful gorgeous everything she's ever been in that I've seen personally I've liked um, Connell Cochran is one of my favorite villains in any movie of all time and this movie's plot is just a, is pure Halloween. Like, like I said, when I was a kid, I was obsessed with Halloween, the holiday. And this movie just screams Halloween. Yes, it does have some repetitive music, but I love, uh, what is it, Chariot of the Pumpkins? That, that iconic song by John Carpenter. It's one of my favorite songs John Carpenter has ever made for any movie. It has my favorite of the soundtracks from the Halloween franchise. The fact that it ties in the first Halloween film as a movie in this in this movie, <laughs> if that makes any sense, is awesome. I love that Easter egg. I love how they tie in the Halloween theme from the first two movies into this as well to, to treat it like it's its own standalone movie, but at the same time still a part of this franchise. Some of the effects in this movie, like I said, the gore in this movie is great. Some of the visuals, you, you can't unsee this shit. Like the guy pouring gasoline on himself and lighting himself on fire and exploding the car is fucking bat shit. <laughs> um, like the whole messing with the mechanism and the laser beam shooting at the woman's face is gnarly as shit. The whole robot angle, robot humans and Connell Cochran being this ancient being from Ireland. He's like thousands of years old and he just wants to be evil for the sake of being evil and turning kids heads into fucking bugs and worms is gnarly it's gnarly this whole plot is batshit crazy wild and adventurous yeah the main character played by uh, tom atkins he's not the greatest guy and a lot of people really disconnect with this character and can't get behind him you know he is kind of a f a floozy of a character you know he's a piece of piece of crap but the reluctancy, the reluctant hero angle, I appreciate because it's different. And I like how, you know, <laughs> I like the element <laughs> that he has with the girl he works with that he wants to, like, have sex with. But at the same time, they become, like, sidekicks in this whole ordeal. It's just, it's just bonkers to me. It's, it's a bonkers movie with one of my favorite times of year in it. I love the idea that it, that it includes children in it. Because when I was a kid, it, it connects me to my childhood when I watch this film. And it sticks with me for that. And it's one of the few movies that still scare me today. Like, it still gets to me a little bit every time I watch it. And actually, I think it gets better. It's like fine wine. As it gets older and as you rewatch it more and more, it gets better and better and better and better as you watch it. And I can totally understand people putting it in their top five. I've seen plenty of people starting to put at, put it as it's the number two in their in their rankings. I put it as my number one, but you know, to me, the two greatest Halloween films in this whole franchise is 1978, the original film, and Season of the Witch. The anthology, in my opinion, is the best route you can go in this franchise. The two best films. Uh, that's debatable, but Season of the Witch, to me, is that movie in the Halloween franchise that I love. You know, even though I love this guy, Michael Myers, 
I love Laurie Strode. I love Jamie Lloyd. I love Rachel Carruthers. I love Tommy Doyle, even. I love Kara Strode. I love some characters in this franchise that don't deal with this movie. <clears throat> but this movie is just tailor-made for me. To me, this is a cult classic film. It's one of the most critically underrated horror movies of all time. And yeah, if it was marketed as Season of the Witch and it was a standalone movie, a lot of people have argued that this would have been a, a staple of 1980s horror. But I already think it is. I don't think that you need to kind of remove it, remove the name out of it. Just a, a, approach it like you know that Michael Myers isn't in it. And it isn't a Michael Myers movie. And I still think you'll have fun with it. Just my recommendation. Plus, the ending to this film. It's one of my favorite endings of all time in any movie, ever. Ever, ever, ever. It's so iconic. That twist is bonkers. <laughs> it's such a downer ending. You, you just, I can't describe it with words. It just, it's so fanatical to see this wild batshit plot with this reluctant hero. He has some funny banter to him. You know, you got wild science fiction going on. This sinister plot with this movie villain, you know, you know, willing to hurt kids. And then you have this downer ending on top of it. It just gets to me. And I love it. I love it. I love it for being different. And, you know, and a lot of people might see that as a cop out. Like, oh, why? You just love things because it's different. You know, you got to go get some stuff. No, it's not because of that. It's because I genuinely like this movie. It's one of, like I said, it's one of my favorites. I don't want to keep rambling on and on and on about it, but I, I just recommend to you all give it a try. Give it a fair shot. It, even if you don't his, haven't historically liked this movie, please go give it a fair shot. Yeah, this is one of my favorite movies of all time, actually, if you ask me. This is one that I would actually put in my top ten favorites of all time. Um, yeah. So, that wraps up my Halloween ranking. Alright, like I said, if you want to go watch part one, I got a link in the description with my bottom three of the franchise. If you want to watch my part two, which is the middle five movies, I'll also have that link down in, below. And let me know on this video, what are your top five Halloween movies? In what order? What movies would you put in your top five? Maybe give reasons why. Um, maybe if you want to put your whole ranking on this video, go ahead. Uh, I want to know. Keep the conversation open. Keep it classy, though. And I'll see you next time.